You think about that statement in the Bible. That's a powerful statement. It's easy to read and it's easy to hear somebody else say it. Then you wonder when tragedy hits you if you're, you're going to be able to say that. Wow. Let's open up to 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings chapter number 19 kind of goes hand in hand with this message here. 1 Kings chapter number 19. The context of this passage, if, as most of you are familiar with, Elijah has had this great contest with the prophets of Baal. And of course, fire came down from heaven and God answered the prayer and then the prophets were destroyed and then Elijah saw the sign and said, hey, rain is coming after this long three-year drought. And he goes back to Jezreel there with Ahab. But then notice in chapter 19 what happens. Verse number 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entry and end of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenants, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. The Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing over the message. Let's see, Brother Jeff Kennedy, do you mind praying for us, please? Lord, we thank you so much for your precious word. And Lord, we just ask that you would give us the wisdom to deal with the things that are going on in our lives. And I pray that you would give us the faith to endure it, Lord. And I pray you would bless Brother David this morning as he preaches the word. I pray you would help him, Lord. I pray you would help us as well. Amen. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Like I said, we're all familiar with the passage. We know that in chapter 18, we see Elijah at his greatest point. Excuse me, I'm choking. At chapter 19, we see him at his lowest. Chapter 18, he's at his best. 
Chapter 19, he's at his worst. You know, in chapter 18, Elijah is doing something for God. In chapter 19, God does something for Elijah. And so obviously, Elijah is at a quitting place in his life. He is done. He's at a point where he's gone through different things. He's had different experiences in his life. He knows certain things, but he's at a place because of the circumstances. Things have gotten all twisted and turned around. He is finished. He is throwing in the towel. And I think it's interesting when the angel talks to him, he makes the statement, look at it if you will, in verse number 7. The angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great. You know, really, when you think about Jezebel and her sending down the soldiers, you know, to have him killed, number one, the opposition's too strong. And you see him, he's expended of all his energy after all that he did and the preaching, calling down fire from heaven. He killed all those prophets of Baal. And all that, his, his energy's gone. His flesh is too weak. Here in verse 7, the journey's too great. And then when you have the fire and the wind and the earthquakes and all that, you have the distractions are too many. There's so much against us. And you know, sometimes if you just step, step outside of spiritual discernment, the odds are stacked against us. And in your own life, maybe what you're going through this morning, you've kind of made yourself come to church. I'm glad you did. Sometimes you have to make yourself do things spiritually because you just really don't feel like... You ever read your Bible when you make yourself read the Bible? Because you know you're supposed to read the Bible. By the way, you're supposed to read the Bible. Amen. Amen. Uh, you say, preacher, you always feel like reading the Bible? No, but I do it because I need it. Amen. Sometimes when you're a little bit sick, you know what? Your people that try to help you to get better, they'll say, here, eat this chicken noodle soup. <laughs> and you don't want to eat it, and you got some saltine crackers maybe, or some cheese toast or something like that, and you just eat a little bit. When you're sick, you don't want to eat, but you need to eat. And so what happens is you might have just drug in here and maybe you're ready to throw in the towel. Maybe some of the marriages in here are about ready to be busted up. Maybe some of you, you're just done in your spiritual life. You're tired of fighting the flesh. You're tired of the pressure from the world. You're tired of saying no to sin. You're about ready just to give in. And that's Elijah at this point. A lot of people are ignorant of the fact that the journey is too great. They just kind of cruise through life and they think they can just take life by the, the, the heels and they can just go through and they're just ignorant of it. Some people deny that the journey is too great. They just act like and they live in their own little bubble. Uh, some people, they succumb to it and they're just overwhelmed. Very few people get to the place where Elijah does, and thank God he does, where he's willing to get the help from God that he needs to get through it. And I'm telling you, if we're going to make it as a Christian living in this life, we're going to have to have the help of Almighty Amen. God. Amen. And so I want us to look at this, this passage here. Back in verse number 3, there's a small statement. It just basically says when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. And we think, well, he just hears about Jezebel coming to you know, send the people to kill him. By the, way, by the way, Jezebel's a wicked woman. And I don't need to re-preach a sermon on a wicked woman, but there are wicked women. And she don't like the preacher because the preacher preached on sin and the preacher made a non-profit organization out of her false prophets. And she don't appreciate that. You know, so you have this situation here where you've got this woman that sends this and that's what we think at first. But however, when we get to verse number 10, I think it's more than that. There's a lot more than just this woman trying to send some people to get Elijah. There's a whole nation with the burden of how they're going to respond to God now that's on the shoulders of Elijah. But notice verse number 3, when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. You have two things here. You have vision, then you have vanity. Vision is what you perceive. What are you looking at, Elijah? Well, he's looking at the fact that Jezebel sent out this order, and now that she has put out this order that his head is wanted on a platter, and so he runs. Instead of seeing the power of God or the plan of God or the purpose of God, all he sees is what she's trying to do. 
The Bible says, while we look not at things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. What are you looking at? Now, we're going to see that a little bit later on in the passage, but when you're looking at it, you're going to ask yourself this question. Is God in that? Elijah's looking at what's happening here, and he sees that she's coming after him. All he can see is, I've got to save my skin. I've got to save my life. So he gets up and he runs. It's amazing that he wants to save his life, and then when he gets to where he's going, he wants to die. <laughs> Why didn't you just hang around and let her take care of it for you, Elijah? <laughs> but you'll see the vision, what he perceives, and you see the vanity, how he interprets it. Overreacting is one of the effects of despondency. It adds to our troubles. I preached a few messages ago, making a mountain out of a molehill. And you can take something that may be true, something that's partially true, something that is true. And you can make a giant. And here we have Elijah. He knows that she's coming after him, but how is he going to respond to this thing? How is he going to react to this thing? Well, he just takes off and he runs. And he does something in his own life that he really doesn't approve of. You ever do something in your life? Surely you don't. You ever do and commit a sin in your life that you don't approve of? Absolutely. So what do you do next? Well, you can do a couple things. You can act like it's not a sin. That's what the world does now. The world, what they're doing now is they're saying certain things the Bible condemns is okay. And, of course, the church has been doing that for years and years as well. Christians have been doing that. Instead of being honest, and that's what's sometimes hard about church, because you come in and you got all the superficial veneer has to be pulled back, and then you have to examine yourself in light of the Bible. When the Bible exposes you, what do you do? You can either pretend it's not you, or you can cover it up, or you can lie to yourself and lie to other people. You've already been lying to God. Or you can be honest and get some help with it. What we're going to find Elijah, Elijah's brought to the place where he's going to have to depend on God. And I love this passage because we see the tenderness and the grace of God. And so often we see the, the, the hand of God. In other words, Elijah did have the hand of God on him. And so often we see the judgment of God. But a lot of times we fail to see the love and the mercy and the care of God. Yeah. Now, God does want to help us Amen. if we're willing to get help. You know, the Bible says if you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Amen. Amen. He's not only faithful in the good times, He's faithful in the bad times. He's not only faithful when you're serving Him, He's faithful when you're not serving Him. No matter where you go, God is. He's always there. He's always faithful. He's always going to love you. He's always going to care for you if you're saved. Now, if you're not saved, He's always going to say, Hey, you need to get saved. He deals with our sin. He deals with us where we are. And thank God He does that. You'll notice here in verse number 3, we have some conduct that comes out of this state of Elisha, you'll notice in verse number 3 you have isolation. He arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah. Notice he left his servant there. So if you look on a map, it's a pretty long journey all the way down to Mount Horeb. So he goes from, from, uh, from Carmel over to Jezreel. That's where Ahab was. And then from there he goes down south. You've heard the expression from Dan to Beersheba. You know, some preachers, they preach from Dan to Beersheba, you know. <laughs> They're all over the place, from the top of Israel all the way to the bottom of Judah. And Beersheba is down at the bottom of Judah, which is the southern tribes down there. So he goes all the way down there, which is close to the Negev Desert down there, if you look at your map. And then he leaves his servant and he walks another day. Notice this problem of isolation. At this point, we know the story of Elijah. At this point, there's no bubbling brook. Remember how he had the brook at Cherith? There's no ravens bringing him some longhorn steak dinners. <laughs> bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. There's none of that. He's not at Zarephath where there's a widow woman there that's got the little bit of meal and, and she dips in the barrel and feeds him and dips in. There's more in there and there's more in there and there's more in There's none of that. There's nobody there to help him. And he has put himself in that predicament. He isolated himself. 
You ever see when, a, when, a, when an animal, especially a dog, I guess a cat may do it too, but a dog, if a dog gets really bad hurt, it'll just go off somewhere. And it'll go off and isolate and just sit there. And sometimes Christians do that. They just isolate. They just get away from everybody. Maybe they're worried about what they're going to say because they're out of whack. You ever had an out of whack day and then you say something you wish you wouldn't have said to somebody? Just because, you know, you just wasn't, you know, running on all cylinders. Maybe that's why they want to push away. Maybe they don't want anybody telling them how wrong they are. They already know how messed up they are. The last thing they need is mom or grandma or grandpa or brother or sister or church member to say, you sure look bad. What happened to you? You still doing that? All they need is your smart aleck mouth. Maybe that's why they're pushing away. Maybe they're pushing away just because they're so full of hopelessness. That's all they know to do. The fact is, you see it. Isolation. Maybe Elijah thinks he doesn't need people because people are just as bad as he are. He is. <laughs> Maybe he doesn't need people because some people are better than he is. He didn't want to be around them. You ever get around somebody and they're better at you than everything? It gets under your skin. <laughs> They can catch more fish than you can. They can kill more deer than you can. They can play the music better than you can. They can sing better than you can. Maybe that's why he doesn't want to be around others because maybe his servant had faith in God and Elijah had lost his faith in God so he don't even be around him. I don't want to be around this guy. He's just going to quote Bible verses. Or maybe people are worse than you. Whatever it is, it's a bad place to be in, that isolation mentality. I'm telling you what, as Christians, we need each other. And look, I understand we're not just some institution. You just don't show in, show up, and show out, and leave. I understand all that. And I know we're not digging into everybody's business, and we're not here to have you stand up and tell all your secret, intimate, uh, most feelings. I understand all that. But there is something to do that helps us with Christian friendship. You need it. Iron sharpen of iron, the Bible says. You need somebody that can be honest with you and you can say, give me your honest opinion. What do you think? Somebody that you trust, that's following God, that loves God. You need that. You need to know that you're not the only crazy person in the world, that somebody else loves God and wants to be in church and somebody else wants to hear preaching and somebody else wants to sing and talk about Jesus. You need that. You need to know that. You need to know there's 7,000 that haven't bowed their knee. And I know people can blow up things and they can talk about all this stuff, but it's the people that don't say anything that there's still a lot of people out there that are not saying. There's still a lot of Christians in America. I know Americans going down the tubes. I get that. I know all the nations will be turned into hell. I understand that, but there's still some Christians in this country. You should have some Christian friends. You shouldn't isolate yourself. It's a dangerous place, and oftentimes it's just a symptom of something that's going on on the inside. Isolation, and then notice verse number four, introspection. Look what he says. He sits down under the juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die. Look what he says. It is enough now. O Lord, take away my life. I'm not better than my father's. Aren't you glad God doesn't always answer your prayers? (laughs) And the Lord didn't answer his prayer. He's like, Lord, go ahead and take my life. Lord's like, I ain't taking your life. You speak like Job's wife, just like a foolish person, right? You just don't know what you're saying. Just say it. I know you got to say it because you know what? Sometimes your emotions can say things that are not based on facts at all. You can be stirred up about something that might not even be true. And you're walking around in a delusion. That's called a false fixed reality. Lord's like, I know you're just speaking like a dumb human. I'm not going to answer that prayer. Introspection. You notice in the passage as he goes out later on and he's got to defend himself, he says, I, 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 I'm the only one, I'm the only one. Notice that egotism. Everything is centered on him. He might not be one that walks in the room and tries to get everybody to look at him. However, he's still thinking about himself. So sometimes we always think what we think is humility is still pride. Because what it is, is it's a consumption of self, egotism. 
Some of you people, you are worried about what you wore and worried that somebody's going to think you look funny this morning. Nobody even knows what you look like. Nobody's even looking at you. Amen. They're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? But what happens is it's very easy to get stuck on self when you are going through a trial. When you're going through a test, especially when your moral character has been broken down, when you've done something you know is wrong, when you've done something that's displeasing to God, it's easy to look at, especially if you, and with our crowd, we're used to Bible preaching, we're used to pointing out error. And man, you start doing that to yourself, you can start condemning yourself. And I'm not saying you shouldn't judge yourself. The Bible says we should judge ourselves. However... There's a difference in conviction and condemnation. The Holy Spirit will convict you, but the Holy Spirit will offer hope. The devil will condemn you with no hope at all. That's the difference. So you want to understand, he's isolating himself here. You'll notice that everything's all about himself. He's consumed. He thinks about everybody else in relation to him. Everybody else, it's like the whole nation is on his shoulders. How they responded is his problem. Well, what happens? What a great passage. He's sleeping there in verse number 5. He is exhausted. And by the way, sometimes your physical condition, you can be just run in the ground. Maybe you're working a lot of hours. You're dealing with a lot of uh, stress. Um, sometimes manual labor is a lot less stressful. Sometimes if I want to clear my mind, I will do like I tell some of these young people do. I'll get a shovel and I'll go plant some stuff and dig some stuff and cut some trees and, and do stuff like that. And, and it, that kind of stuff clears your mind. And some of the stuff that you all deal with in some of your jobs and so forth, you're dealing with all this stuff. And it might not necessarily be physical, but it's taxing on your spirit. And you're exhausted. Elijah, spiritually, emotionally, is completely drained. Physically, he's wiped out. He falls asleep, verse number 5. And thank God the angel comes and touches him. Psalm 42, verse number 5. Why art thou cast down on my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 10, it mentions the angel coming and touching Daniel. Acts chapter number 12, when Peter was arrested and he was put in jail there, the angel came by and he was asleep. Imagine that, just sleeping in jail. And you say, why? Because he just trusted God, everything's going to be okay. <laughs> kind of like David Livingston, you know, he said, hey man, I can sleep in, uh, if I'm in Africa and I've got all these lines and stuff around, if I'm in the will of God, I can sleep at night. I'd rather be in the will of God in a violent situation than be outside of the will of God in serenity. Peter's asleep in the jail, just taking it easy. The angel comes and touches him. You know what Elijah needed right now? Elijah needed a touch from God. And that's what we need sometimes. So what kind of a touch was it? I don't know. I think it was a gentle touch. Here's what I see in the passage personally. The Lord is a lot more gracious to us than we are to ourselves. The Lord's trying to bless us, not beat us. <laughs> the Lord's trying to feed us, not fleece us. He's trying to lead us, not lure us. He's trying to clarify things, not confuse things. You know, we're, we're kind of running, we're shy, and I know we should fear God, and you ought to fear God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But if you're saved by the grace of God, even if God punishes you and chastens you, He does it because He loves you. So even though he may touch you, it's a gentle touch. That's what Elijah needed. He needed somebody to care for him. It's amazing to me in the passage as we read through it here, there's not a lecture going on. There's not a, semina a seminar going on. There's not this place where the Lord sits down and starts straightening him out and tells him how, how much of a sissy he is. And by the way, it's still bad. It's still, it's still a wrong thing to be a sissy. I don't know if that's not probably not correct to say that either. There's nothing correct to say anymore. 
Little sissified boys need to be yanked into reality. You need to learn how to be a young man. But uh, maybe he was kind of, you know, thinking the angel was going to say, okay, you sissy, what are you doing running from a woman? Big mighty a prophet Elijah standing up there saying, hey, you know, if you, where's your God at? Mocking the false prophets and preaching and calling fire down from heaven. You're running from a woman? But that's not what the Lord did. The Lord didn't come down there to beat him up. He didn't come down there to change his mind. I think it's a, it's a gentle touch, but it's also an awakening touch. He wakes him up. Notice what he does. Verse number 5. He woke him up and said, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, verse number 6, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. This angel makes, and I just, it's, to me, it's, it's cornbread. <laughs> And he's probably got some, some white acre peas there on the side. But he's, he's mixing that cornbread up and just making it, you know, like on the top of the stove. Put your oil in there and just pour it on top and burn it on there. He's making that. And boy, that makes you hungry. And he had the woman make him some, some bread back there earlier. You know, the woman at Zarephath, she made him some cakes. But man, this is crafted by the hands of an angel. That angel's over there cooking. Verse number 6, he ate some, gave him some water, and let him lay down again, verse number 6. You know, Job's friends, he was singing about Job. When they came to him for seven days, they did the right thing. For seven days, they just sat by Job, didn't say a word. You know, sometimes when a Christian's in a very depressed state and they're in a bad way, they don't need a sermon. They don't need a lecture. They don't need you to tell them how wrong they are. They need you just to be there, just to sympathize with them. That's what the Lord's doing. He's just making him some food. We do that when we have funerals, when we have deaths in families and so forth. That's a southern tradition. When somebody has a death in the family, the way you show them that you care is you take them some, some high-calorie food. <laughs> you take them some sugar that's going to put them in a coma. You take them something like that that's not healthy for them to eat. It's comfort food. Big old thing of mashed potatoes, man, and gravy on top of it. Amen. Cornbread and peas and pork chops and colored greens. And the greasier the better. Fried okra. They're so greasy you eat them, your socks fall down. <laughs> I knew I'd wake y'all up talking about food a little bit. But that's what they need. You don't, you know, you don't go in there and say, what happened, you know? Why is all this going on? And they just need you to take the food in there and tell them you're praying for them and just be there. That's what Elijah needed. He needed a gentle touch and he did need a awakening touch. And notice he goes back to sleep. That means he needs a second touch. I don't know how many times the Lord has passed by my way, but it's been more than one occasion. I've been in a place where I've just felt isolated and I've just gotten away and, and maybe I've gotten into this place of, of depression, discouragement, despondency and the Lord just kind of passes by and maybe throws a little handfuls of purpose for me, kind of like He did Ruth. says, hey, you know, it's still worth it. Hey, there's still something for you to do. I'm not done with you yet. If I was done with you, you'd be up in heaven. I've only had one person in all my years of having people tell me different things when they go through near-death experiences or, or you know, recovering from sicknesses. A lot of people say, well, I guess the Lord's not through with me yet. I've only had one person say, the Lord's not through with me. He told me exactly what He wanted me to do. I thought that was pretty unique because most people just say, I don't know, you know I don't know what I'm here for, but the Lord's not done with me yet. And sometimes the Lord passes by and He says, you know, lift up your heads. This thing's not over. When it's over, I'm going to say it's over, and it's going to be over. But it's not over yet, Elijah. Here, you need to eat a little more. Arise and eat. And he says, the journey's too great for thee. Another thing I notice about this is that he's not stopping Elijah at all in verse number 7. Elijah's headed to Horeb. The angel didn't tell him to go there. 
Nothing indicating in the passage that that's the direct direction from God. Elijah has got his mind set that he's going down to Mount Horeb. And by the way, Moses is 40 days and 40 nights on Horeb. There's 40 days and 40 nights to Elijah to get to Horeb. And we know that Jesus Christ has 40 days and 40 nights tempted in the wilderness. There's a comparison there. And it's interesting as you think about this because the angel doesn't correct him. He doesn't guide him. He just says, you've got a big journey ahead of you. You better eat. I think about the Apostle Peter after he betrayed the Lord and denied the Lord. He cursed three times. He swore. He was upset with Jesus. I believe that's why he did that. After Christ rose from the dead, Peter was still on the outs with the disciples. The Lord rose and he told the ladies, he says, Go tell my disciples and Peter that I'm risen from the dead. Make sure you go and find Peter and give him a message. That's just like the Lord, isn't it? The Lord sees you when you've fallen. He sees you when you have failed. You talk about being a failure. I guarantee you we could have a depressing testimony service if we wanted to yield all of our failures. I have failed Him more times than I have succeeded. And if you'd be honest and look at your life, you would say the same. And what does the Lord do? He passes by and says, You know what? I'm going to love you no matter how you treat me. I'm going to be a blessing to you. I'm going to try to help you along the way. Elijah, you need to eat. You've you got a big journey ahead of you. He just passes by. and Thank God for that. We have a touch, but then we have a testing. He comes to Mount Horeb, and it's a testing. The number 40 seems to stand for testing in the Bible, though. The children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for those 40 years. You remember that? Remember when Goliath came out? There's 40 days he's out there testing, tempting. Come out and fight. We have Christ being te tempted in the wilderness 40 days. Here we have a 40-day journey down to Mount Horeb. He saw 40 sunsets go over the east as he journeyed down south to Mount Horeb. And he gets there and goes into a cave, finds some lodging. Verse number 9, The word of the Lord came to him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Now, the Lord has better questions than we do explanations. But there's a lot in this. What, Elijah, what are you doing here? Now, the word of the Lord had came to Elijah before. We know that. You can back up when you see Elijah show up on the scene back in chapter 17. And you keep seeing that phrase, the hand of God's on Elijah, the word of God came to Elijah, and so forth. And here it is again, but never like this. What doest thou here, Elijah? Now, my thing is this. As you, it's kind of a complicated passage. It's one of those things. You read it, and you get a little something, and then you read it again, and you see it from a little different perspective. I keep asking myself, if Elijah answered correctly in that next verse, why does he ask him the same question again? And then Elijah gives the same exact answer. So something's going on. There's more to it. I don't believe Elijah is answering correctly in verse number 10. There's a lot that's telling in the answer. You ever notice how somebody sometimes give themselves away when they say something? They say, I'm not insinuating anything, but... That means they are insinuating something. I'm not trying to be mean, but... That means they're about to be mean to you. They, they give themselves away all the time. So a lot of times you can ask somebody a question, and as they're answering the question, they're giving themselves away. They're telling you exactly what the answer is. They just don't realize it. I think that's what Elijah's doing right here in this passage. Elijah, what are you doing here? And here you are maybe in church this morning about to quit, and God says, what are you doing here? Not what are you doing here in Calvary Baptist Church, not what are you doing in your Sunday best sitting in church. We know that, thank the Lord. But what are you doing in this point in your life about to quit? What, do you, what doest thou here, Elijah? Verse 10. I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. The children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. What strikes me is, in verse 10, he starts off talking about the, well, himself. But then, it's him versus who? The children of Israel. It's not him versus the false prophets. You see that? They are trying to kill me. I thought it was Jezebel trying to kill you. No, it's, the, it's Israel. 
They have cast off the prophets. Well, I thought that was Jezebel and Ahab and, uh, you know, everything rises and falls on leadership, you know, and you get the wrong person elected and this can happen and that can happen. No, he is talking about the people. Because what happened back in chapter 18 when the fire fell? He says, this fire is going to fall. He says, show them that you've turned their heart back to you. The fire God fell. He killed all the prophets. And then what happened? Ahab goes to feasting because the rain's coming. They go back to eat, and here's Elijah standing out in the rain. What did the children of Israel do? Did they stand in the way of Jezebel? No. They're just glad that they're getting some rain on their crops. You see, there's more going on with Elijah. It's a me versus them mentality. Elijah has isolated himself. It's all about him now. There's nobody that loves God like he does. There's nobody that serves God like he does. There's no better preacher than Elijah. There's no better husband than Elijah. There's no better wife than Elijah. There's no better mom, better mom or dad, or better worker or employer or employee, whatever you want to put in there, than Elijah. He's it. He's the poster child. Everybody else is wrong. What are you doing here, Elijah? I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. What does the Lord do in verse 11? He tells him, go stand forth upon the mount before the Lord. It doesn't tell us, look at it in verse 11, that he gets up and goes. He's still in the cave, verse number 9. Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. A great and strong wind rent the mountains, break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, and after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out. That's when he goes out of the cave. He gets to the entering end of the cave, and then God asks him the same question again. So what's the answer? The Lord's answer is pretty obvious. He's not in the spectacular. In other words, God is working, but maybe not in the way that you think he's working. I mean, who would have thought in 2020 we would be where we are now, the beginning of January, All these things will be happening. Is, is it, did it take God by surprise? No, it didn't take God by surprise. Sometimes we look for the spectacular. We look for the wind, the earthquake, the fire. We think that's how he's going to work. I think the question is this. When you see these things, when you look at these workings, these movings, you have to ask, is God in it? Because God wasn't in the earthquake, and he wasn't in the fire, and he wasn't in the wind. He's in the still, small voice. And I think a lot of times we discount that as believers. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit on the inside and you have the Bible. And God can speak to you, but God will never contradict the Bible. You know, some of these people, they act like they're just, you know, God, they have, God have a one-line communication with God. You know, the Lord told me to cook eggs this morning instead of grits. Uh, the Lord took me. I'm surely the Lord wouldn't tell you not to cook grits. That's right. You should have grits with everything, right? Amen. Uh, it's like everything they say. Well, the Lord told me to do this. The Lord told me to quit my job. The Lord told me to divorce my wife. The Lord told me to, what? What are you talking about? The Lord told me to do this. The Lord told me this. it's like okay. You're just you know whatever you think. You think God's talking to you. It's you talking to you. You're talking to yourself in prayer instead of talking to God. So you've got to be careful of that. However, the Lord does speak and he impresses us with his mind which comes from the word of God which is spirit. Amen. That's why it's important to be in your Bible so God can speak to you with that still, small voice. And so I think the Lord answers him. Fact versus fiction. Is God in that? And he says, what doest thou here, Elijah? Ask him again. And then verse 14, the same thing. Verse 15. Notice the Lord still is very gentle here. He hasn't rebuked him yet. Verse 15, he gives him something to do. He tells him, I'm not through with you. You've got to go down here and anoint Hazel over Syria. You've got to anoint Jehu to be king of Israel. 
And then you've got to train somebody. And he trains Elisha for about 15 years or so, I believe, at least for 10. Before Elisha ever does any miracle, Elijah has to die, but Elijah's, Elijah's still not finished. A lot of us, we have to go through transitions in our life and we think that we're done just because we can't do the same thing that we used to do. But life is always about change. You don't expect a teenager to be having the same ideals and, and uh, purposes and so forth as an adult or as someone that has a family. And someone that's already got the kids out of the nest and they're at home by themselves and their grandma or their grandpa, they're not supposed to be living like they're in their 20s. Amen. There's always change. And he's transitioning Elijah to... I kind of think about that with Moses. You know, he gets to the end of his life. And he doesn't die because he's, he's decrepit or sick or anything. He dies because God takes him. His eye's not dim. His natural force is not abated, the Bible says. But at the end of his life, you know what he does? He dies on top of the mountain, but he also dies training two of the greatest men, Caleb and Joshua. And he doesn't get to go into the land, but he's able to train Caleb and Joshua. And they're able to go into the land. So you never know what God has you doing here. And that's exactly the purpose he has for Elijah. And then finally, verse 18, you see the gentle rebuke. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which have not kissed him. So what happens to Elijah? Well, I'll tell you one thing. He never runs from a king or queen again. Matter of fact, 2 Kings chapter 1, king of Syria is sending messengers to try to find out if he's going to recover from a disease or whatever. And Elijah hears about it and says, intercepts him and says, hey, uh, uh, no, I'm getting my uh, stories wrong. Oh, yeah, you know, he sends somebody to intercept and says, hey, is there not a God in Israel that you're going to inquire, a God of Ekron? And the king uh, gets upset and says, hey, uh, what's this guy doing this? And he sends 50 soldiers to apprehend Elijah. They said, old man of God is sitting on top of a hill. Ever since Mount Carmel, he loved to sit on top of hills. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But he's sitting on top of a hill, and uh, they're like, thou man of God, come down. Elijah said, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down and consume you. Boom! Fifty soldiers like that. What happens? They send another battalion out. Fifty soldiers. Same thing. Thou man of God, the king says, come down. He said, I ain't coming down. I ain't worried about a king. If fire come down from heaven... Boom! Kills them. The next guy comes up and begs and pleads and goes up and says, Hey, you know, the king. He says, You just tell the king he's going to die. He's not scared of a king or a queen again. And Elijah's not done. He gets to go up when the Lord comes and takes him up in that chariot of fire. Louis L'Amour, the old Western writer, some of you may have read his books. I know my grandfather read a lot of his books. You've seen some John Wayne movies. And uh, there are a lot of them made after some of the Louis L'Amour westerns. He made the statement, There will come a time when you will believe everything is finished. That will be the beginning. <coughs> he said, what is it? Sometimes it's a starting over place. And I'll close with this illustration. You ever, so I'm talking about authors, you ever read a novel and you're going through there and maybe you're reading a chapter and man, the way the thing's going, it looks like it's just, it's awful. All kind of people are dying off. Things are going bad. And, and uh, you're reading through that thing. You're just like, this, this thing's finished. But that's just one chapter in the book. Then when you finally get to the end of it, you see after you go through all these other chapters and you realize what all had to take place and then it ends maybe totally different than what that one chapter portrayed it as. And we look at Elijah. Here he is in one chapter of his life. He slides up under that juniper tree. He is done. He quits. Ready to die. That's just one chapter. I think the Lord slides up beside us and says, Hey, you need something to eat. You need some water. You're a little dehydrated. Maybe you needed some potassium. Did you take your vitamins this morning? <laughs> Maybe you need some of those collard greens and cornbread. And then instead of just slapping you upside the head, he begins to encourage you and say, you know what? And let me, let me give you this. There's not a sin or a mistake or trouble that you've gotten into that the blood of Jesus Christ can't cleanse you from. Amen. Amen. 
And there might be some repercussions in this life that you have to deal with, but you can make things right between you and the Lord, and you can get up from Juniper Junction, and you can move forward. Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. I'm going to ask the pianist to come play an invitation hymn. Just give you a few minutes to pray this morning. I don't know who this message may have been for. Maybe everybody here is fine. Maybe you're running on all cylinders. Everything's great. Maybe you're not discouraged. Maybe you're not down and out. Maybe that's not you at all. However, maybe somebody here is. The opposition seems too strong. The flesh seems too weak. The journey seems too great. The Christian life seems too hard to live. You need some encouragement. Maybe the Lord's passing by your way this morning saying, look, it's going to be okay. You just need to feed on His Word, feed on His provisions, learn to trust God. Get your focus off of yourself and put it on the Savior. Just deny yourself and follow Jesus. He may ask you some questions you don't quite understand. And, but listen for that still small voice. Maybe you just need to take that first step this morning and say, Lord, I am at a bad place. God, I need your help. I don't have the answers, but I know you do. Lord, help me, please. Thank you for the great text that we read this morning, the great passage. Lord, I pray that we would get some encouragement from it. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in here. Lord, a lot of times we have no clue the trouble and the storms that may be taking place on the inside, young or old, man or, women, man or woman. Lord, we just pray for each person here that you may help them, God. I pray, Lord, that we could turn our eyes upon Jesus Christ and realize that you have a plan and purpose for us. Lord, help us to stay focused on you. And God, I pray that we'd realize that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for second and third and fourth and fifth chances. Lord, you've been so merciful to us. God, I pray that you might just pass by our way. Maybe some discouraged person that's here, you might encourage them not to quit. God, give us some help. We need some answers. Lord, sometimes we get turned around because we're not looking in the right place for the answers. And I pray that you might help us. I pray that you be with these requests that were mentioned this morning. We pray for any unspoken requests here that you may answer those needs and just help your people. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thank you for being gentle and encouraging, Lord. We know that you do rebuke us, and we, we take the rebuke as well. But we thank you for loving us and being compassionate. God, I pray that... You'd forgive us and help us. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.